President, distinguished uh, members of uh, Parliament, uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen, and my uh, old friend and predecessor, uh, Jap, it's uh, a great honor to be here and to be able to address you uh, all. And thank you for the kind uh, welcome. It is really a great pleasure for me to address this uh, assembly because uh, before I became uh, Secretary General of NATO, uh, I was elected as a member of the Norwegian Parliament for uh, more than 20 years. And during that uh, period, I learned about the importance of uh, parliamentary assemblies and I understood that. Uh, executive bodies, being it government or being it Secretary Generals of NATO, have to stay in close contact and how to work, and how to work with parliaments. And um, the experience of being a member of the Norwegian parliament taught me the true value of parliaments, to hold governments to account, to ensure that taxpayers' money is well spent, and that uh, the views of people are heard. This is my first opportunity to speak with you, but it will not be my last. I intend to meet with you regularly, to consult with you and to seek your ideas. This is important for me. Today, NATO needs you more than ever. We are working hard to turn the decisions we took at the Wales Summit into reality. On my first day in office, I outlined my three priorities. To keep NATO strong, strong as a political alliance and strong as a military alliance. To work with our partners to bring more stability to our neighborhood. And to keep the bond between North America and Europe rock solid. Each of these priorities requires financial resources underpinned by political will. For without them, there can be no security. And without security, there can be little else. No safety, no prosperity, no freedom. And the link you provide as NATO parliamentarians uh, to the parliaments and the citizens of your countries are vital for NATO. And this is why I today would like to discuss with you a core issue, keeping the defense pledge that we made at the Wales summit. Because we all have to remember that uh, with the end of the Cold War, the world changed and defense budgets were cut as people rightly demanded a peace dividend. With no imminent territorial threat, this made sense. Later, with the financial crisis, the cuts became even deeper. We have gone from standing armies to a small, to a smaller deployable forces. From a NATO command structure of 22,000 to less than 9,000, and from over 33,000 tanks to less than 7,000. We have also postponed new investments, reduced our exercises, and cut back on maintenance. I'm not going to argue that we need to return to where we were and have exactly the same forces the same capabilities and structures as before. But once more, the world has changed. To our east, Russia is trying to replace the rule of law with the rule of force. To our south, we see violence and extremism across North Africa and the Middle East. And we continue to face all the challenges from missile proliferation to cyber attacks. So we must keep up to these changes. 
we must have more we must have more and better equipped armed forces and we must have the right balance between forces and capabilities so let me be clear this is not just an exercise in accountancy the stakes are high the threats are real so we must redouble our efforts to resource our alliance the readiness action plan we adopted at the Wales summit is the most significant strengthening of our collective defense since the end of the Cold War. It will help us to deal with threats from wherever they come, from the east or from the south. So it's, so it's vital that we implement the plan on time, in full. A key part of this is the new spearhead force, a very high readiness force able to react quickly with the command and control presence in the east and part of our alliance and a demanding new exercise program so we can have the right forces in the right place at the right time. At Wales we also decided to launch a new mission in Afghanistan to train, advise and assist the Afghan security forces from January. And I welcome that the parliament in Afghanistan have uh, ratified the legal agreements we need to implement the resolute support mission from the 1st of uh, January. In Wales, we also decided to increase our support for our partners, such as Jordan and Georgia to build their own defense capacity and project stability in our neighborhoods. All these efforts must be properly resourced. And our military needs long-term investment and political support for readiness comes at a cost. If you look around the world, you see that while NATO has cut defense spending, others have rapidly increased it. Over the last five years, Russia has increased its spending by 50%, and it plans further increases. At the same time, total NATO defense spending fell by 20%. In more peaceful times, it was right to reduce defense spending, but we do not live in peaceful times. So now it's right to stop the cuts and to increase investment in our defense. This is not just about comparison to the rest of the world. It is, it is also about the balance within NATO and within Europe. The GDP of the United States and that of Europe is, is almost exactly the same. Yet the United States spends more than twice as much on defense than all the other allies combined, providing over two-thirds of total defense spending by NATO allies. All allies are expected to shoulder their fair share of the burden in terms of spending, in terms of capabilities, and in terms of contributing to our operations. So at our Wales summit, we agreed to invest in our collective defense and to have a more balanced sharing of cost and responsibilities. We made a joint pledge to stop the cuts, to increase spending in real terms as our economies improve, to move towards spending 2% of GDP on defense within a decade, to spend better and to deliver the capabilities we need. We also agreed to review progress annually. We will start at the meeting of the defense ministers in June and we will also place it on the agenda of future summits. 
But the Warsaw Summit 2016, we must show progress and a way forward to further improvement in the years ahead. So we need to make the best of the time we have. I know that increasing defense spending is not easy, but it is possible step by step and every step counts, starting now. The United States, the United Kingdom, Greece and Estonia are already meeting the 2% guideline. And I'm encouraged that a growing number of allies have out outlined their intention to get there. I count on all of us to deliver. Of course, this is not just about how much money we spend on defense. It is also about what we, this, what we spend the money on and how we spend it. At Wales, we committed to spending 20% of defense budgets on equipment, technology, and research and development. We have identified specific areas where we need to improve our capabilities, such as ballistic missile defense, training and exercise, and full equipping our land forces. We must make progress on all these areas to ensure that our forces remain strong and able to deploy at short notice. NATO can really add value when it comes to how defense budgets are spent by helping allies to align their priorities, to plan together, pool their resources, and to get the most for taxpayers' money. There are many examples of how we are doing just that. For example, the new system of drones and other capabilities that make up the Alliance ground surveillance system, operated and maintained by NATO giving our commanders a comprehensive picture of the situation on the ground. Or the framework nation concept agreed at Wales, where groups of European allies work together to develop particular forces or capabilities guided by a lead nation. And here in the Netherlands, we are in a country that is a prime example of regional cooperation. Dutch, Dutch armed forces cooperate closely with their counterparts in Belgium, Luxembourg, Germany, and the United Kingdom. Naval forces combined with Belgian naval forces under a single admiral. Allies gain a great deal from multinational cooperation, including our smart defense initiatives, getting the most out of every dollar, every euro, and every pound. To spend better, to spend smarter is important, but it's not a substitute for sufficient resources. We cannot do more with less indefinitely. And defense cannot take an excessive share of the austerity burden. We must be clear with our publics about why we need to increase defense investment. And we must continue our efforts towards greater transparency. When it comes to NATO budgets, allies maintain full control over how much and how effectively taxpayers' money is spent in the interest of our shared security. The budget is rigorously audited by an independent team of auditors. And this independent board regularly reports to the North Atlantic Council. Allies review all reports, and unclassified reports are now published on the NATO website. I also intend to continue publishing an annual report on what NATO does, including defense spending. And we will go further. In February, I expect defense ministers will agree on additional measures to increase financial transparency and accountability. Ladies and gentlemen, defense investments in times of austerity 
calls for hard choices at home, in every government and in every parliament. But the time has come to stop cuts. We must invest more in defence and spend our money better. And you, the parliamentarians, play a vital role in fulfilling the defence pledge we made at the Wales summit. This is the first time heads of state and government have made such a pledge. And it is a pledge we must honour. Honor. It is my responsibility to work with you to implement that, what we decided. And I am personally committed to this. We all need to work hard and we will all be judged on the progress we make. So I need you to make the case at home, to increase the momentum for more defence spending, to reach out across the political spectrum and to persuade your, consist your, your, your constituents of the value of defence investment. So we have much to do together and I thank you for your support. Thank you so much.